Hi, my name is Brian Dunn. I'm the founder and owner of Great Divide Brewing Company in Denver, Colorado, and you're watching The Beer Diaries. How's it going, man? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm Greg from The Beer Diaries. Greg, I'm Taylor. I'm uh, head brewer at Great Divide Brewing Company. Awesome. Thanks for coming down. I'm really excited. I mean, I love your guys' beers. I think we might find a Yeti inside there. We might find uh, more than one. More than one. Chocolate, oak, all kinds. We'll see what we got. Awesome. Well, thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. You bet. You want to head in and check the place out? I do. Let's go. Great. So this here is our tap room. Yeah. Place for the local community to come and try out our beers right, and right. enjoy them. Uh, we've got 16 beers on at any one time. Wow, that's an awesome selection. Yep, and you had mentioned Yetis. Um, we've got four of those on right now, which everybody loves. So you can do the Yeti panel. You can try all the exactly, Yetis. Exactly, which a lot of people do. Oh, that'd be pretty wild. And also specials. You have like pilot brews and stuff you do? Exactly. For example, right now we've got an IPA on that we just brewed not too long ago. It says Big Fluffy Meow Meow. I, yep. don't, know, I, don't, know, I don't know what style that is. So um, Big Fluffy IPA. Meow Meow is our uh, pilot IPA that yeah. we just brewed. Oh, cool. Uh, don't ask where the name came from. I'm not <laughs> yeah, sure. That's <laughs> but it random. works. Look, do you want to get a little deeper into the belly of the beast? And... You got it. Let's head in there. Yeah, I'll follow you. I don't want to trip over stuff. That's my usual approach. All right, so this is our mill. It's a four roller mill. Essentially what this is going to do for us, it's going to take our base malt, which is usually malted barley, yeah. two row malted barley. It's going to crack it open and expose the starch for us, which will become important later on in the process. Our barley is 100% malted in Colorado. Oh, awesome. About 70% of it is actually grown in Colorado Very as cool. well. So that's, I mean, that's kind of unusual. I mean, a lot of times folks have to get their barley from elsewhere, but you're in a good position to be able to get it here. Exactly. We're very lucky with our situation. Yeah, lower energy footprint, good for the environment, all that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. There are tons of benefits. Um, in addition to barley, we um, use a lot of different grains as well here at Great Divide. We brew a rye beer, for example, yeah, so yeah. we're using malted rye. We use a lot of malted wheat. We even use rice, which I know a lot of people uh, <laughs> think is uh, kind of taboo, but uh, we think it imparts some great flavor and right, aroma right. in certain beers. So if you do it the right way, not as, if you do it the right as way. a filler adjunct. Exactly. Yeah, sure. We're highlighting the rice when we put it in there. Very cool. All right, so this is our brew house. One unique thing about this place is we actually have two brew houses in this room. Like the, the, the junior and the senior. Exactly. This is a pilot system, seven barrel pilot system we picked up uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah. So that's where we brew all the fun uh, experimental stuff that we'll either put on the tap room. Additionally, we'll pilot beers that are going to get ready for full scale production. Behind that, you'll see our full production brew house. Right. It's a 50 barrel brew 50 house. Barrel. Uh, allows us to produce, um, we can max out about 70,000 barrels in a year with this the whole, brew house. The whole facility, yeah. Exactly, that's what we're capable of doing with this. We were in the mill room. Yeah. That grain, it gets milled, it winds up in that conical vessel you see up there. We call that the grist hopper. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, mill, it's uh, cracked, it's ready to go. We're gonna drop it into our mash tun, which is that vessel right over there. Right. Uh, in there, we're gonna essentially just mix it with hot water. Mashing is a process where all that starch, there's a bunch of enzymes in there. Essentially, those enzymes are gonna become active and they're gonna go after those long chain starches and turn them into short chain sugars. That sugar is what we're gonna to use to make beer a little bit later on. That's what on. E yeast eats up. Exactly, in terms of the yeast is gonna eat the sugar and create alcohol, a bunch awesome. of other fun stuff. So at that point, we're gonna take that liquid, which we're gonna call wort, yeah. and we're gonna move it into the kettle, which is this vessel right here. Yeah. In the kettle is where we're gonna boil the wort, that's where we're gonna add hops. That's gonna take anywhere from an hour to two hours, depending on the beer. When it's done boiling, we're gonna send it through that contraption right there, that's a heat exchange. Okay. Essentially, it's gonna take the wort from boiling to, in our case, about 17 degrees Celsius in almost instantly. Wow, so it's like it goes through very there fast. as fast as yeah. we can pump it through, it cools it down. Awesome. And from there, it's gonna to go to a fermenter. All right, so this is the tank farm. It's probably one of the most impressive set of fermenters I've seen in a while. Well, thank you. Yeah, we've got 40 of them out here. We've got 23 more inside, but the bulk of our production comes from these 
tanks right here. And they're 300. These years. are 300 barrel tanks, so wow. essentially that means we brew six times on our system to fill up one of these tanks. That'll take us about 36 hours. Wow, so like, like day and a half, quite literally. Exactly, quite literally. <laughs> that's quite, that's amazing. And then, I mean, obviously, and, and beer stays in various lengths, like how, what kind of lengths of time will they stay in? Good the question. So once we send the wort and pitch the yeast, um, it could be as short as, say, two and a half weeks for a beer like our wit. Yeah. that we brew. Um, something like our Imperial Stout, the Yeti, those can take as long as three months. Um, sometimes we need to add oak, sometimes yeah, we yeah. add the espresso, depending on what we're doing. So that could take a lot longer. So this is the packaging line. A little bit noisy. Yeah, very noisy. That's, that's the reality of working in a brewery, I yeah, guess. Exactly. I'm filling it one too. Yeah. So the way this whole setup works, our glass comes to us in bulk format. You see that pallet over yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They load it onto this machine. It's called the depalletizer. That machine's essentially going to take the glass off those pallets, put it on that conveyor belt over there. Right. The single one single file. Kind it of eventually runs makes its way to single file. Okay. And then it heads into this station. First, uh, kind of carousel you see over there is going to rinse the inside of the bottles out. Oh, kind of grabbing and flipping them over. Exactly. Yeah. And then the second carousel is where the bottles are going to get filled. Okay. In addition to just filling the bottle, it's going to purge it with CO2 first, try and get any air out of there. Right, right. Fill them with beer, and then right at the end, there's a little jet of CO2 that gets shot in there that actually makes them foam over, which is what you see. Additionally, a crown or a cap gets put on the bottle right before it leaves that station. Yeah, yeah. From there, it's going to go to the labeler. As you can see before the labeler, they're just plain bottles. Yeah. After, we got label beer bottles. Like magic. Like magic. Put the body label and a neck label. Yeah, that's really cool, actually. It seems to be like a little, little brush kind of statement on there. Exactly. From there, the bottles are going to collect over here. Now, while all this is going on, there's some packaging machinery upstairs that's building our case boxes and erecting our six-pack holders. Oh, really? Those are coming down on a uh, conveyor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are coming from upstairs. They're meeting up the bottles right there. Oh, cool. That machine's dropping, in this case, 24 bottles into the case box and they're making their way out where they're going to get put on pallets. Um, and then the beer goes to consumers. Exactly, and people get to drink it. Yeah, that's the, the best part. important part. Makes, yeah. me, makes me a little thirsty, so I think it's time to maybe try some beers and go yeah, there. Yeah, let's get you some beer. Thanks so much for uh, the tour. It was my pleasure. Awesome. It was my pleasure. Hey, great, great meeting you. Thanks. Let's Thank go you. get some beers. Yeah, yeah. Hey folks, I'm Greg from The Beer Diaries. I am here in incredibly sunny Denver. It is like burning up out there, so it's a great time to have a beer. I'm here with Brian Dunn at the amazing Great Divide Brewing Company. Brian is the founder and El Presidente, or is it Presidente? It's Presidente. Presidente, yeah. cool. Well, it's thanks. more Spanish than French. Oh, cool. Well, thanks so much for having us here. It's, it's really great. <laughs> thanks. So you've been doing this just over 20 years? Yeah, the brewery opened in 1994. I started working on it in uh, 1993, so yeah. And you were, home, you were a home brewer to start? Yeah, or? I was a home brewer, and um, the story kind of goes earlier than that. I grew up in a house where um, drinking and eating were very important. My dad was into beer and wine and oh, cool. spirits, and my mom was a big cook, so family meals were always important to me. There were five kids in my family, and every night we all sat down, we all had a nice meal. My dad had his drinks, and my mom you made know, some was awesome food. Making the food, and I just kind of grew up around all that, and always was into beer. And uh, did you ever think you'd do something like this? Like never. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't one of those. I gotta be a brewer. Yeah. And so when you when you were home brewing, uh, and you felt, did you fall into starting a brewery, or you decided like you, you were sort of passionate about it? No, the way it really worked is. Um, when I got out of high school, I really knew quite a bit about beer, and I knew more about beer than most of the people I went to school with. Yeah, yeah. So I always was kind of like the beer guy in yeah. college. And once I got out of school, I went to school in Fort Collins. Okay. I traveled around for about five years uh, wow. all over the world developing farms. So oh, yeah, yeah. I That's really cool. got into local beer culture. So yeah, I, yeah. I think I bent, went to 28 or 30 countries. So in my travels, I really became kind of a student of beer. I came back to Colorado eventually after being over there for about five and a half years. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I went to grad school, and at that time I started homebrewing. Then I was coming out of grad school, not so sure that's really what I wanted to do in life. <laughs> what, what, what did you take? What were you I, taking? I got a graduate degree in environmental policy and management. Ah. So it's a bit of a quasi law degree. It's like kind of a, like an environmental regulatory degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it that, wasn't, wasn't, that wasn't super sexy. You're like, oh. Yeah, you know, I don't know. It just wasn't really my thing. As I was coming out of grad school, I started writing the business plan. And 
get this going. And so one of the cool things about the location is you are quite downtown here in Denver, yeah. so probably a major destination for folks. Yeah, it is actually, and I didn't know that at the time. I mean, I felt like it was important to be as close to downtown as possible, but... Um, was it kind of a good neighborhood, or was it on no, edge? No, it was really run down, and we were here a year or two before Coors Field opened, so... Ah, so you kind of we, beat We had heard it was one of the location, potential locations for coming in, so we knew it was going to... or I felt like it was eventually going to yeah. gonna come through, but um, it was pretty rough. And so we're sitting in the tap room, um, and this is one of the things that's really awesome about Colorado as well. You guys can have, you basically, you're, you're making the beer, like literally, you can see through the windows where the beer's being made, but you can also, you know, sell beer that's freshly brewed right yeah. here. Yeah. How long has this been going on for? This room's only been here about five years. So we um, have always had people com come in and buy growlers or buy beer to go or also whatever. Also you can do growler fills. So we had those, those sales for a while, but um, we, we never had enough money really to make it friendly to yeah, people yeah. walking in through the front door. And uh, the front door for 15 years was a, a steel door with no window in it. All <laughs> these windows were glass block and you couldn't see in them. Yeah, it yeah. just wasn't very friendly. Yeah. The premise of the business was to produce beer, yeah. bottles, kegs, yeah. get it out the door. And, and, and you that, did that for quite a while. And we did that for a long time. And that was, and we dealt with tours. And as the tours started getting kind of out of control from 9, 10, and 11 in the morning, like we just started getting, the, the interest in tours really built to the point where yeah. we just couldn't manage it anymore. And then we said, maybe at this point, let's do a tap room. Yeah, let's organize yeah. the tours. We'll do tours at set times. We'll sell some beer retail. We'll be able to t interact with people that are interested to know about the brewery yeah and that's the premise for the for the tap room so i mean obviously people are it's always a mystery to them what happens behind the curtain yeah. there like no they love seeing it and i think the other thing too is is folks really like seeing and like especially if it's local like that that local thing has become very important and so like a local brewery that you know it makes it here in town yeah. you know seeing the place uh, one thing I noticed too, I mean, that kind of goes along with that is a lot of community stuff. You guys do a lot of support, a lot of community events, yep. a lot of charities. You guys are real focused on environmental issues. Maybe, yep. maybe that, that that graduate degree way back. Yeah. Obviously, you know, you're it, thinking about environmental some stuff. On things, yeah. Yeah. So how does how does the sort of the, the supporting the community and the environment stuff kind of fit into your philosophy? Well, I think it's really really important to me. First of all, I mean, we've grown a lot over the years, but it's primarily because of the the Colorado community and the Denver community who have supported us. Right. Um, I also am deeply am indebted to the city of Denver because when I was starting this, I was about $50,000 short to get this business started. And I had raised some money from friends and family. Yeah, yeah. I had, then I went to the banks. I had 11 banks say no oh, of course. to they, a $50,000 loan. They only want to lend it to you when you don't need it. Exactly. That's they, don't, a bank. they don't lend to startups. That's yeah, yeah. a little that's, known that's secret. That's the whole thing. But um, the city of Denver came through in 1993 and wow. lent me $50,000 at a time when no banks would ever do that. Right, so right. the city ultimately came back in a number of different times. They helped us expand a couple times, helped me buy the building. They did a lot of different so things. So really supported you they to totally make this possible. Totally supported That's us. That's awesome. And in fact, an interesting thing is I went to the city once to ask them to, I was trying to borrow money to buy tanks to expand the brewery. And the guy that I was working with told me that the most important thing for the city was actually to see lights on on this corner. And he said, I would rather <laughs> see you do a tap room yeah. and I will lend you money to start the tap room ah. before I will lend you money to do more tanks. Interesting. So that's really, we had some city money to get this building or get this room started. So one question I had, I was, you know, sort of playing off the far field. I mean, you're, how many states? How many states are you guys in at this point? We're in 18, 18. states. And then also around the world, I think we were talking earlier. Sweden, yeah. Sweden yeah. of all places. Yeah, yeah. Those, those Swedes, they have yeah. a taste for beer. They have a taste for strong and eclectic beers. Yeah, so, yeah. Is, like, that, is that kind of how you describe your beers? Like, I mean, because you do have a lot of very bold. I mean, yeah. you, have a, you have a range, though. I mean, like, we're bold I'm very, but balanced. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, over the past few years, we've made sure that we do have approachable beers. Yeah. Um, we have a Pilsner, we have a Saison. I kept having the rye uh, this lager. This is Haas, it's a rye lager, quite yeah. approachable. Yeah. So it's, we have both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. I would say maybe five, six years ago, we were definitely <laughs> tilted toward the bigger, bolder. Well, you guys are very well known for those. Um, I mean, like yeah. the old ruffian. But still those beers are balanced. I mean, yeah. we make some big, chewy, assertive beers, yeah. but I also, uh, it's important to me that beers are balanced and yeah. it's important to me that the beers that come out of here are balanced so how did those recipes come about like did you test a lot or did you just yeah. made them or how'd that go in the early years we did not test so when i was brewing and kind of running production for maybe the first five or eight years yeah no we would 
Just kind of go for it. Think through recipes quite a while. Because yeah, you kind of knew what like the ingredients we, would yeah, do. Yeah, we knew what ingredients would do to beer, and um, we were pretty successful at coming up with beers, but not not yeah. test batching them. Right. As we got more people in the brewery and things changed, and now we have a pilot system. We have a seven barrel pilot system, so yeah. all beers now get test batched yeah, yeah. quite a few times. And so you guys actually have. Let me get. I think I get this right. Nine regular beers and yeah. twelve seasonals now. Is that about yeah, right? Yeah, twelve and seasonals, not including the barrel aged beers, which so kind of come and go. Kind of special. Yeah, those are beers. So we do oak aged beers, which we're, we're oaking beers in barrel in uh, fermenters. Okay. And then we do a barrel aged series where we're putting three or four different beers into whiskey barrels. Whiskey barrels got it. So those come out. We age those for about a year and a half. So we never know exactly when yeah, those are coming yeah. out. They come out when they're ready. So when you taste them and, and try them. Exactly. So one thing I'm sure folks are curious about is Yeti. I mean, huh? the whole, huh? and if, when you come here, it's really cool because there's all kinds of really neat Yeti paraphernalia yeah, around. Like, yeah. where did the whole Yeti concept Yeti come Yeti from? Come from? Uh, Yeti's an interesting story. Um, I came out with a beer, um, we came out with an Imperial Stout and, a, and an IPA, and we may, named it uh, Maverick. Okay. Okay? So I have historically done all the trademark searches over the years. So I did a trademark search on Maverick. Okay. It was clean, so it was okay. nobody was using it. So it came out with these two beers named Maverick. Eventually we got a phone call from a brewery in California that had a, a beer named Mavericks. Ah, okay, um, got it. And it ended up to be a conflict and we stopped using it. So we were then forced to change the name. Yeah, you're sort of in a bit of a bind. You're like, okay, in a bind. yeah, what do you do? And uh, so the IPA became Titan IPA, oh, okay. which is our best-selling beer. Yeah. And the Imperial Stout was renamed to Yeti. So that was 2002 or 2003. Okay. So Yeti has been around the brewery since, you know, for quite a while. Good 10 years. Good 10 years, 11 years. In the early 90s and mid-90s, I was quite sure that the only time you could sell a beer over six percent was the winter. Right. <laughs> so for years and years, that, that may have been kind of true back then too. It, you it know? was true like, then, yeah. but it now it's totally changed. Yeah. And um, so when Yeti came out, it was just going to be an imperial stout. It did quite well, and uh, we started goofing around with uh, wood aging beers, and that was a natural first. Uh, beer to wood age, so Oak Age Yeti became our first wood age beer okay, okay. that came out probably a year after Yeti, so maybe 2003, 2004. Got it. We came out with Oak Age Yeti. Uh, what, the Colorado scene, you're probably really well positioned to kind of have seen the transition locally here. Like, I mean, back, again, back from 93, 94, 20 years. What what's the evolution of the industry been like, or the, the scene from your perspective? Like, there's so many breweries here now. Yeah. They all fit. I mean, they all do something different. I would say the biggest change really has been in um, beer drinkers' knowledge and, ah. and the knowledge also of the, the stores and the distributors that sell our beer. So, in, you know, in the early years, we would try to convince good restaurants to carry beer. And they say, well, we only carry wine, and we have Heineken anyway. Yeah, yeah, we so, only have some good European beer. And that was in the mid-'90s, and now all those guys yeah. have eight draft lines, yeah. and four to six of them are local. Yeah. It's great. So that's, that's the biggest change that I've seen, is that there's so much more beer knowledge and appreci and appreci and appreciation, across the U.S., appreciation, it's not, yeah, it's not yeah. just Denver. But um, in the, you know, people of the bars and restaurants and liquor stores, of course, you can see that the coolers have changed yeah. to have a lot more uh, selection of craft beer. Are there any um, brewers in the state or the city that you've collaborated with or any you've kind of helped each other out, like best bu best buddies in the brew beer world? The people always are helping each other. Yeah, it's a very common business, theme on uh, craft brewers. For sure. I mean, everybody... People call us, we call other people, we sometimes lend equipment, we lend parts. You know, a lot of us have the same sorts of equipment. Yeah, the yeah. bottling line, we're the same as Avery. We borrowed parts from those guys. Yeah, yeah. They borrowed parts so from Trey, us. So Trey, sometimes, I don't know if it's guys are saying they sometimes say, hey, I'm short of a certain type of hop and they'll borrow it from someone. And it stuff. happens all the time. So since we're in front of a, in front of a bunch of taps, let's get some beers. Good so. idea. Let's do uh, Colette. Corey? Awesome. We're gonna do Colette, please. Thanks. All right. And Colette is a farmhouse saison? It's a farmhouse saison, yeah. We have had it for a number of years. When it first came out, it was just called saison. Okay. And um, it was a seasonal beer for us, 22s only. Like a lot of our beers, it's kind of evolved from a seasonal and kind of made it into a, a year-round rotation. And so you said it was, so it started as a seasonal? It started as a seasonal and started as 22 ounce only. Last year, for two years in a row, it was a six pack seasonal okay. for us. So that means it comes out for about three months and then goes away. Got Thanks, it. Corey. Thank you. And, um, and then 
I told you earlier that we um, got rid of some beers. Yeah. Last year we got rid of two beers, and uh, this became a full full time awesome. beer. Awesome. Well, so, cheers so. first. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. <sighs> nice estuary. Like, yeah. Fruity. Got a little bit of spice to it. Nice and dry. A little, a little bit peppery. A little bit of tartness to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there are no spices in this beer. Um, that was that always amazes people until they understand the magic yeah. of yeast, right? Yeah, I like, know. People are like, oh, what kind of spices are in here? It must be kind of orange peel. And yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, no. I mean, we do some other beers with uh, curacao orange peel, but yeah. not this beer. All the spicy or fruity character in this beer comes from yeast. It's kind of, yeah, really tart fruit, like lovely yeah. tart fruit in the finish. It's been a really fun beer. And what's really interesting about this beer is, I mean, it's a 7.3%, I was going to say 7.4, but 7.3% is a fairly, to me, esoteric style. But this beer appeals to a lot of people. I have a neighbor who only likes Coors Light, but he loves this beer. So it's, it's always interesting to me the, the wide range of people that can gravitate towards this beer, yeah, although yeah. it's fairly unusual. It's, it's very drinkable, you know, it's a real drinkable, good with food, yeah. I mean, very pairs really well with a variety of foods. Yeah. Uh, and also like, yeah, this, this patio beer, man, this yeah. is this great patio beer. Even though it's a higher, little higher alcohol percentage, it just goes yeah. down real easy and it's a fun beer. Nice and, nice and dry. It's really one of the reasons why we got rid of Samurai, which is an unfiltered rice beer, is I think this was a better uh, beer to go with food. And to us, that's really important. We put food pairings on all the labels. Oh, that's so very cool. That's important to us, and we do a lot of beer dinners. Charcuterie, so. foie gras, curry, yeah, camembert. I think moufrite frites, they say sometimes, you know, the, yeah. the mussels, mussels and, and fries, fries yeah. commonly with saisons as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. Those so are. that's important to me, and so I think this is a really, really nice food beer. It's why we wanted it to go from a seasonal part of the lineup to, to your own. Cool. Yeah. So we'll, what should we try after this one? What should be a next? Uh... I think we'll try Haas. It's a, it's a rye lager. This so, is a fun beer. It's, yeah, it's um, a little different, different use of rye. I've, I've never seen rye in a lager, actually. Yeah, so this is a, kind of in the Martzen style, sort of a fall-style ah, okay. lager a little I, bit. It's quite malty, kind of robust. A um, little bit of a rye addition gives a little spicy, yeah, finished, earthy yeah. character to it. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice beer. Right? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, lagers, of course, you know, finish really dry, usually really clean beers, nice and nice and clear. Yeah. So, and, uh, but there's also a lot of malt to this beer, so um, you know. Our beers have a pretty wide range. I mean, oh, to yeah. us, this is a very malt-forward beer. Yeah, it's not, not, it's not overly hoppy at all. Like, there's a very light bitterness yeah. to this. Like, a, yeah. is it probably a nice noble-type hops on yeah, this yeah, one? Yeah, for sure. Yep, and German pills are malt. Yeah. So, yep. Um, we've had this beer for about four or five years now. So what's what's uh, let's see the pairing for this one? Bratwurst, barbecue. Chicken, carnitas, pork, pork tacos, camembert again, camembert, camembert. It's camembert on this one too? Yeah, this is, these, we're, we're on the camembert Whoa. run, I think. And chocolate cake. I never noticed that. Thanks for picking that up. We yeah, got I like the carnitas taco. I think it's, it's actually really good with carnitas. No, I can see, I can see definitely the... Kind of caramelized pork, kind of the yeah. roasty, uh, kind of crispy pork. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't know anything oh, about really? that. Oh, really? I don't know about that. I have tofu, and I have to have barbecue tofu version. <laughs> really? I was just thinking, Can yeah. you caramelize tofu? Not really. No? no. Brown? It's fake. Yeah. You put sauce on, you brown the sauce, and yeah. go from there. Poor guy. Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm doing well. So we have another uh, couple of beers. Let's leading. see what else we have here. We've got like We'll get some Hercules going. And then we'll get a Hercules bottle up. And Hercules is your, is that the double IPA? It's a double IPA, yeah. yeah. Double Let's, IPA. Um, so we're expecting, and I, this, I've definitely had this beer before, and so it's a pretty hearty. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good, I mean, lot, very, very hop forward. I mean, great. But give it a try. You'll notice that there's a lot of malt to this. So this is, yeah, no, exactly. when I tell people that we like our beers to be balanced, this is a really good example. There's a. I don't know, and, and, and IBUs, I think it's 85 IBUs, which is really, really high. Really, really great, like, oh, but there's the hops are just, I mean, it's so lovely on this, like sort of tropical fruit plus a bit of citrus on there, like. Yep. But there's also quite a bit of malty sweetness, and that really helps. Yeah, it finishes, it finishes sweet, like a little tiny bit of sweetness right at the yeah. end. So heavily hopped, it's really very hop forward, but it's got a lot of malt to kind of balance that out. Got a lovely hop on this yeah. one, and like you said, it's not it's not overly bitter. Like it's yeah. it's balanced. And and what do you think the ABV is on this beer? I'm not getting much warming. I mean, a little bit of warming, the hint of warming. I'm guessing actually it's probably nine-ish. Like, yeah. like it's ten. So wow, it's a little bigger than most people think, but um, 
It's, it's not, I'm not into like super imperial yet. Or yeah, ultra it's not imperial. too hot. You know, it's uh, no. You, there's just a little bit of warming it's, it's on balanced. it. Like, it's, yeah, it's no, a very, really, it's this a very is, balanced double IPA. One of the guys, one of the brewers in Austin, we had this conversation with Gateway Beers, and he said this was his Gateway Beer. So the Hercules? Yeah, and they were, all, they were all joking with him, saying yeah. it's like the, the door kind of hit you in the face on the yeah. way out because this is like. But I think it was just you know that incredibly fragrant, powerful. Um, you know, but, but balanced and very drinkable. Yeah. So let's move to another one. Okay. So this one is a kind of a special one, right? Yeah, this is a, a new beer for us. It's a 19th anniversary. And some years um, our anniversary beer changes and some year it does not. So there, there was a period where we probably did two or three years of the same beer. Um, but this one's quite different. And um, this is a strong ale. Uh, brewed with birch syrup that we got from Alaska, and then aged on birch wood. So it's really so it's the birch surprise. It's the birch surprise. It's really different. So um, the oak aging that we typically do is with, or the the wood aging that we typically do is with uh, with oak. And this one's a little bit different. Yeah, it's got a really interesting finish, yeah. like, like the you, woodiness. And can you taste that it's different than oak? Uh, yeah, the, 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 there's no vanilla in this at all. Yeah, like, yeah it's got. Yeah, kind of a yeah, an interesting wood. It's kind of a wood character without being vanilla. Yeah, not smoky, not tannic. No, it's interesting. That's no, really it's got, got some sweetness, not a ton of hops to this beer. A little bit warming, so I'm guessing this is high percentage as well. Is, yeah, this, is this up in the nine to ten? Ten two. Ten two. Yeah, this yeah, is. I knew it was over ten. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's actually. I mean, it's it's, it's funny because it, again, it's a unique. I mean, it's always neat finding a beer that's a very unique, unusual flavor. Yeah. But this is yeah, this is yeah. Oh, it's really, it's really neat, actually. Like the oak ones, you know, yeah. Once you once you start trying them, it's kind of the same thing with bourbon barrel stuff. Once you start getting really used to that, you can kind of pick those out. But this, yeah, yeah it's I different. Would, all the woods taste different. I mean, we've messed around with cedar. We've tried all sorts of different. Cedar kinds tastes of wood. like a humidor. Yeah. Like if you have a really yeah. heavily, heavily done yeah. cedar beer, like yeah. It's, we've tried, I think, four or five different kinds of wood, and um, this one's really different than oak. So. Cool. I think now we should probably move to the grand finale. Yeah. I think I can reach it myself here. I'm betting this is the, uh, oh baby. Chocolate OK Jetty. That is the special one. So the Yeti stuff, I mean, it's so well known among beer geeks. And like, you know, like, like the stuff that you guys do with, with this beer, it's just remarkable. Like I think, and, it, and the fact you've done so many variants on it, yeah. is, 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 it's always, I mean, you're always it's guessing. It's been really fun. We didn't know that we were going to do that. And a lot of people ask me, and they're like, you probably knew that you were going to do all these variations. I'm like, in 2002? <laughs> no, I had no idea. Yeah, so. they, had, they hadn't worked at a brewery before. They didn't know how, yeah. how, how it's hard just like, to come up with a good recipe every yeah, once in a while. My ability to forecast isn't quite that good. So, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. This beer is uh, brewed with cocoa nibs. Cocoa Smell, nibs smells like are, chocolate ice cream. Yeah. I think, well, I don't know. Cocoa nibs are like the small little... It's kind of roasty. Oh. So cocoa nibs are beans, and that's the, uh, the precursor to chocolate. So it gets processed into chocolate. Um, so it's brewed with cocoa nibs and a little bit of cayenne pepper. Oh, so a little bit of heat from that? Yep, and then aged on oak for about six weeks. So this beer is very chocolatey, um, which comes both from the malt but the cocoa nibs. It's roasty. Which Definitely comes, roasty, yeah. Which comes from the, the malt. A little bit of smokiness, and, maybe? Uh, there's a little bit of heat on this beer. Yeah. So as it leaves your mouth, and maybe, depending on the person, Immediately little, to five or ten seconds, you can perceive little, yeah, just a little heat. bit, a little bit of heat in the back of the throat there. I can imagine this on ice cream, like on yeah. vanilla ice cream. This must be like, like I mean, what do you reckon? See, so your recommendations it's a here. Sipper. Well, why don't you read it? Raw oysters, side. New York strip, chicken mole, yeah. roaring forties blue cheese. That's kind of specific. Yeah, <laughs> creme brulee. It's from Australia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Chocolate raspberry mousse cake. So, I think, yeah, this is a really fun beer and. Um, What's interesting is that people perceive the cayenne at different levels. Some people are very yeah, it depends on the use you are. It, 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 some are not so much. You know. I think I definitely it's interesting. You definitely get it right in the finish, as you said, as, as it kind of is leaving your palate. Yeah. I find it gets get a little slight tingle, but yeah, I mean it's really. I mean, you know, some some sometimes the carbon dioxide in the beer or even a bit of spiciness inherent gives you that kind of same feeling. But this definitely yeah. you have to get a little little, little zap. Yep. Yeah. So that's one of um, I think we. Uh, Every year we do four different variations on the Yeti. Actually, you're kind of rotating these through. So um, probably over the years we've probably done six, seven, eight, something like yeah. that. But do you have a favorite, like a personal favorite of yours? I drink all of our beers. Yeah, you, you love really, all, really all, the all the all the child all beers. The children. <laughs> I've all these uh, sort of half finished beers. I'll deal with later. Yeah. But uh, this has been an amazing chance. To, I mean, great to have a chance to stand with you. You've been doing this right. for a long time. Well known. Dude in the industry, you guys 
I mean, we've got a bunch of, I'm not sure they're on camera, the, like the medals, yeah. there's this whole rack of medals that you guys have won over the years for your beers. Incredibly awarded brewery. Takes uh, a lot of people, though. It's not, well, yeah, it's not just oh, me. no, there's, I know. Well, the there's team, 46 right? people that work here, and well, everybody. Uh, and every day's got to, they got to be cranking every day. Everybody has an important job, and everybody does a great job. And no, that's We're well, lucky, because we work with really, really great people, and yeah. everybody's very passionate and caring about what they do here. Yeah, I know it's a great, great team making great beers. I'm so. lucky to work here, actually. So one of the things I always do is I always declare a favorite, and yeah. I mean, I gotta say, it's clearly the beer in my hand. I mean, the, the chocolate OK Yeti is utterly exceptional, uh, complex, delicious. It's a really, really fabulous beer. So, awesome. um, thanks so much for for having us. This has been a You're great welcome. experience. Thanks for I mean, coming. You guys have done. It's nice to meet you. Oh, you too. I mean, the, you guys have done such a great job for beer and the beer business. It's it's awesome to meet you. So good. Thanks. Slancha. Cheers.